Can turn the lights down, please. All righty, welcome everyone. This is the one year anniversary of Limpy Heroes Houston. So thank you for joining. Again, uh, we know it's three o'clock on a Friday, so you may be in clinic or you may be off, whatever the case may be. This is being recorded, so we will get it out to you uh, as soon as we have it uploaded to YouTube. So if you are here live, uh, we do have the chat function going. So the conversation between um, Dr. Smith and uh, CLT Kirk will be conversational between the two of them, but definitely feel free to put your questions or comments in the chat section. And at the very end, if there's some time, we'll go through those uh, and we can also distribute those to them directly if we don't have time to get to it. So again, high level, uh, those of you who aren't super familiar with really the, the mission and the vision behind Olympi Heroes Houston, it's really just to cultivate a community of uh, healthcare providers in the lymphedema space. So you could be a certified lymphedema therapist, occupational therapist, physical therapist, or a physician that's seeing patients with lymphedema, or you may have uh, seen an uptick in patients that are in your clinic that appear to be presenting with signs and symptoms of lymphedema or lipedema. So again, our vision here was to just bring this collective uh, platform together where you guys can have uh, conversations online, offline, and really get a chance to, um, to partner up with maybe therapists that aren't in your hospital network or aren't directly there in your neighborhood. So if you have a patient that you need to refer out, for example, you'll have the ability to do that. And uh, my name is Tam Ayala. I'm one of the co-founders of Lymphy Heroes Houston. I'm also a primary lymphedema patient and an advocate. And I'm also your local compression therapy consultant with LymphaPress. So I'll now pass it over to my partner, Sophie. Hi, everyone. Um, for those of you that are new to our um, quarterly meetings, I'm Sophie. I am the other co-founder of Lymphy Heroes. And I am the certified clinical compression specialist um, with Women's Health Boutique and Second Silhouette. Um, and so welcome everyone for coming. We will um, talk about a event that we have coming up later this month at the end. Um, and that's pretty much it. Awesome. So again, yeah, that is going to be our first ever in-person get together. It's going to be at the end of this month on October 28th at uh, Kirby Ice House, but we'll send you guys a follow-up email early next week with more details on that. So without further ado, uh, we're really excited to introduce our guest speakers today. So joining us live, we have Dr. Mahalia Smith, Hi, an occupational therapist and certified lymphedema therapist and wound care specialist, Kirk Coward Bay. Go ahead, guys, take it away. Okay, can everyone see my screen? We can hear you, but it's okay. We can see it now, Kirk. You're good to go. All right. All right. So, Mahalia, I am so happy to uh, see you here, here in the flesh. You know, we've collaborated on uh, many patients in the past, but to uh, actually see you in the same room. That's kind of a feat, um, and I'm glad to see you. I am so happy to see you, Kirk. Um, we've worked together so much in collaboration. Um, doing this together is, is actually a treat. So, Kirk, um, we're talking about perspectives of wound care and, lymph and lymphedema management, but I see all these bubbles. What, what is this about? What's, what's the bubbles for? <laughs> Well, um, you know, I think about um, therapists when they first hear or start with uh, wound care, they kind of feel like they're just thrown off into the deep end and they just continue to sink and they're trying to fight their way up to, um, you know, learn more, understand more and be better clinicians as it concerns uh, wound care. Ah, so kind of like you were when you first started. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes it's a it's a little bit daunting for a lymphedema therapist uh, to 
be presented with a patient with a big wound in a different in in addition to lymphedema. So before we start, let's uh, I want to say that I don't have any disclosures, any affiliations or contracts. Nor do I. I am not uh, paid or hired by anyone uh, to participate in this. Um, so what are you hoping that uh, the audience will get from this today? Um, you know, really, I'm hoping that, you know, this will be a, um, a very educational um, piece that will help people understand how to correctly measure wounds, um, understand the difference or actually more of the benefits of treating wounds and have a better understanding when a wound actually is infected and then how they can actually look at or even describe or be able to know the different types of debridement. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful. Um, one of the things uh, uh, I would say is uh, what's helpful uh, to therapists is knowing what's, what the What's, what's the, the benefit of treating the wound, but also how do they feel when they see a wound? So is the wound care taboo for you or was it taboo for you when you started? Uh, when I first started, I would definitely say yes. It was something that I felt was um, a little scary. I was kind of timid, you know, um, and I noticed that I didn't know as much as I wanted to know. And um, it took me a little while to get comfortable. Um, but once I did, I realized that it is much more approachable than people think. So for what I've gleaned from talking with uh, different therapists is that the smell, they hate the smells, it keep, it makes them crazy. And, and I think that's true for, you know, people outside of wound care. When they think of wound care, that's one of the first things I, I hear that's a deterrent. Um, also, um, people don't want to do harm. You know, they don't know what to do when they see the wound. What do I do now? And they feel compelled to do nothing because they'd rather do nothing than do harm. And the other issue is sometimes is, oh, I just don't want to do that. I just want to do my MLD and bandaging, and it's too, it takes too much time. You know, I just want to be done with it. You know, I think if more people had the appropriate training and they had the resources, then, you know, it wouldn't probably take as much time as they think it would be, and it would be something that's more manageable throughout the uh, treatment. Now, as far as the smells, I, I can't help them with that. <laughs> that's probably going to stay the same. Well, I, I have a few tips. Um, sometimes, you know, you put a little perfume on the top of your lip and, uh, you know, even with masks now, you could spray some on your mask and you could get that all covered, covered up. Um, you know, it takes some getting used to, but eventually, you know, you get used to it. Uh, do you have a strong sense of smell now? Um, you know, I, you know, I, I drink wine and I think I do, but when it comes to wounds, it doesn't really affect me. Okay. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the benefit of treating wounds. I think, um, it's very important for patient satisfaction. If a patient could come to one place and get their wounds treated and their lymphedema treated, it, they, they're satisfied because it reduces the number of co-pays they have. They don't have to go to two different places. It reduces the amount of time off from work. Um, it reduces the driving time. So, you know, from a patient satisfaction standpoint, that's it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you're talking about the amount of pain that it reduces, um, you know, that, and that's pretty instant once the patient comes in and they start getting their treatment. Um, so I feel like that's something that people should understand um, from the get-go. Yeah. Um, you know, the other thing is if you treat the wound, you eliminate so much of the bad odors. 
um, that, that is pleasant for you, it's pleasant for the patient, it's pleasant for their families and anybody they come in contact with. I had one patient who was a young man, 18 years old, um, and he was uh, in college, but he had to drop out because his classmates, you know, went because they, they, they didn't like being around him and he rode the bus mm -hmm. and he told me that the bus driver made a comment right you know so you know he was also weeping he would walk and leave footprints yeah oh yes yeah um you know you talk about smells and odors and you know those benefits you know we talk about and that's one type of satisfaction that you know the patient gets once the wounds are healed or once the drainage is managed, the also satisfaction is a psychological um, factor, you know, that someone will actually treat their lymphedema and treat their um, wound. You know, they feel like a person and they don't really have to go to 15 other places to get something that they feel like is what is, you know, what is needed for them to get better. I think also um, we have improved in ADLs um, because they're now able, you know, the limb feels less heavy when it, they, the lymphedema is being treated, they can move better, and, and also it accelerates wound closure uh, if you actually treat the wound. So that combination of lymphedema and wound care going hand in hand, I think that's a winning combination. That's like a good marriage. <laughs> So we mentioned lymphedema and, and, and you know everybody uh, listening in may be familiar with lymphedema but there may be some people who are not so lymphedema is really the abnormal um, accumulation of lymph fluid um, and when lymph fluid no longer flows well whether it's because somebody was born with a malfunctioning system or someone um, has had surgery, uh, you know, or, uh, or maybe from obesity, as a side effect of obesity, um, you can develop lymphedema. If the lymphedema is uncontrolled, there's so many problems. The skin can get thick and leathery. Um, you can have weeping. You can have um, the stasis of, of, of the lymph fluid can cause the skin to break down and you develop skin injury. So it's important to recognize what lymphedema is. In, and, and the lymph fluid um, is really the, 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 pro, the, the part of the fluid that travels um, as part of the circulatory system uh, that has high protein. And this, if it, when it doesn't flow well, can settle uh, in the skin and uh, promote um, fatty tissue and skin firming. Um, that is not really the normal way that it should happen. So what happens if you take care of the wound, but you don't address the lymphedema? Well, if you take care of the wound and you don't address the lymphedema, I feel like you're just prolonging a long uh, medical situation. Um, you have patients that have been going to wound care for 14 years, 15 years, so on. I have clients that come in and they've told me they've had wounds for 20 odd years. And, you know, they've had their wounds continuously managed. However, there's a lymphatic component that goes unaddressed. And when that goes unaddressed, the tissue can't do its normal magic healing process that it does. It can't, can't bring enough uh, red blood cells to the area. It's got too much debris and waste in there. And what happens is time, material, and the wound healing process just continues to be a staggered process. And in addition, um, the wound now becomes like an open door. So if you do your compression bandaging um, and you uh, moving that lymph fluid along, mm -hmm. fluid and water always finds the path of least resistance and the least resistance would be straight out the womb. So then the peri womb becomes macerated and you have skin for the skin breakdown. So you may start off with a wound of small volume and end up with a wound of larger volume. So what happens if you do uh, the lymphedema without the wound care? What, what, what's um, what I've noticed is if, and this is what I've, what I've seen, 
And if someone does lymphedema without wound care, what's going to happen is the wound care, the wound is probably going to, again, it's going to heal slower. But what also might happen is you might cause uh, more maceration to the tissue. Because if the wound care, I'm sorry, if the wound is not managed well, and especially if it's a excessively draining wound, then you're going to have situations where it's just continuously macerating and you're just, and there's also, you know, with the, with the lymphatic uh, compression bandages, there's also not an, as much air in there also. And so now you've got this breeding ground in addition to that. I agree. Okay, so um, what are some uh, of the outcomes when only one is addressed? Well, you're going to have increased treatment times and that, and that, that opens a whole other door besides the patients, you know, not being satisfied besides the amount of resources you're using. It also puts a burden on your schedule and the possible patients that you are probably going to get in the future. Those patients might end up going to another facility. You're increases the, increasing the amount of resources that you're using. You're either ordering more supplies. It's hitting your budget. Um, you know, and then you're having more expenses than what you would actually uh, hope for, what you budgeted for. Then you've got, again, the delayed healing process, which, again, can lead to more infection, uh, cellulitis, necrotic tissue, and then um, further damage. Yeah, so I agree with that. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about infection. So what would you say if someone asks, how do you know if a wound is infected? Ah, funny you ask me that. Um, because, you know, I think it smells, but, you know, uh, someone who told me once said, the wound will talk to you itself and tell you what it needs. Um, but you'll have like, <laughs> you know, you'll have fishy smells, you'll have ammonia smelling, you know, similar to urine type smells. Some people say it smells like flowers. I personally don't get that. Um, you'll have a wide array of colors that you may see, red, I'm sorry, yellow, white, black, um, green, you know, in addition to that, you'll have excessive amounts of drainage, um, fluid will be um, a little bit harder to manage, uh, pussy uh, may be apparent, and then the tissue health, um, it may be really friable, necrotic tissue, the peri area uh, is um, is really type of hard if you were to uh, touch it. So that's what I would see. Yeah, so um, when we talk about friable tissue, what we mean is sometimes it looks like granulation tissue and you're thinking this is okay, um, but when you touch the tissue with a gauze or Q-tip, a cotton tip swab, it just falls apart and breaks easily. That's not the really healthy granulation tissue. So those are all clues that something is going wrong. Um, in terms of the, the odors, I think, you know, everybody smells things differently. So one person may say this smells fishy. Someone else may say, no, it smells like rotten cheese. Someone else may say it smells like ammonia or flowers. But you will know what that thing is for you. And um, as time goes along, you, you, you will think, oh, that patient smelled like this. It, that won't smell like this. And the culture shows that oh, that's what that smell like. And you would know for yourself what you'll be able to pick up what a certain smell means. Um, so for me, I now, I could, uh, sometimes I listen and I, I, I go in and I, I say, oh, that's Proteus, or oh, that's Pseudomonas. Um, and in the cases where I need to start an antibiotic before uh, the culture results are back, when the culture results come back, it validates whether I was right or wrong, and I learned from that. So, you know, we're talking about infected wounds, and we're talking about uh, drainage and smells, and but we all have to be able to objectively put the same um, data or understand the data that the other therapist, the other clinician, the other physician is putting on the paper or recording. So what I've noticed is I've noticed a wide array of uh, clinicians sometimes measure wounds in different measurements, but I would like, you know, people to understand the appropriate way and the universal way of measuring a wound. 
Okay. So one way um, is to use the face of the clock. Um, or to think of the patient as lying supine in an anatomical position. So with the, the feet flexed and with the toes pointed upwards and the heel on the table. And if you like the clock method, you can say um, if for the wound, the length would be from 12 o'clock to six o'clock. Or if you like the anatomical position, you will say the length will be the widest part of the wound that is from head to toe. Um, for the width, you would go three o'clock to nine o'clock or uh, transverse across the body. For the depth, um, use a cut and step scrub, go straight down, use your finger uh, where the surface of the wound uh, hits the swab and then transfer that to a, a measuring rule and measure how deep the wound is. Now let's talk a little bit about undermining. I think of undermining as like a lip, a place where the edge of the wound is not fixed to the wound bed. And when you do that, you, you want to use a cotton tip swab again uh, or, or something that's blunt, and then you can transfer it, the transfer to the edge of the wound with your finger, and then measure it on the ruler. But you also want to, to, to talk about the direction. So you could say there was two centimeters of undermining from eight o'clock to 12 o'clock. With a tunnel, um, it's it's part of the wound, uh, and not all wounds have tunnels and not all wounds have undermining, but you would want to put the cut and tip swab deep towards a blind pouch. It usually ends, you know, you could feel the end of, of the tunnel, and um, you would measure, again, using your finger to the end, uh, at the top part of the tunnel, and use the measurement, the ruler, to tell you um, how deep it is, but you also use direction. So you would say um, this tunnel was six centimeters deep um, going in the direction of one o'clock or five o'clock. Excellent, excellent. That was a lot of information, but uh, I hope it was clear. Well, we like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like to make things as clear as possible. So what do you do with an infected wound? You would measure the wound and we suspect that it's infected. We could smell it. What do you do? Uh, what do I do? Um, depending on the wound and depending on if I feel like it's something that I can manage in house, then I'm going to, uh, I'm going to debris the wound or, or, and, or put an antimicrobial on there. Um, then I'm also going to, and let's say it's, it is something I can do in house and that's what I would do. If it was something that I felt like I possibly couldn't do in house and it requires a little bit more, um, requires a, a PCP or a wound care physicians um, expertise, I'm probably gonna take a culture um, and I'm gonna probably use an e-swab to do that. And at the same time, even though I might do that, I'm still probably gonna put an antimicrobial on there and have the patient go out and uh, and then see what the um, results are from the physician. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, deep tissue cultures are best, mm -hmm. but those are usually done by the physician, mm -hmm. and um, you know, as part of the debridement or just uh, you know just a, a deep tissue biopsy um, in order to see what grows. And the physician would remove the surface layer to get rid of any colonized um, bacteria and then take a sample from deeper so that you get a, a more representative sample of what's really affecting the wound. So, you know, um, bacterial growth, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, what is bacterial growth? When is it good? When is it bad? You know, um, you know I just think I just like people to understand you're always going to have bacterial growth. There's, and you're always going to have uh, colonization. 
And a certain amount of colonization is always going to be over all parts of your body, over your tissue, and in a wound bend also. It's when that uh, colonization of bacteria reaches a threshold that when the wound starts to get infected. And so that's when sometimes, you know, we call that film over that wound a bio burden, and that's that contamination of the wound. Yeah, that the, so the bio burden, um, it would be the amount of um, bacterial colonies that you would get in, in a given uh, space or surface area. So, you know, throughout the wound healing process, there's basically three phases of wounds. There's three phases of wounds. One's the inflammation phase, most people are familiar with. It's when they see a lot of redness, warmth, swelling, pain. Then you have the proliferation phase, which is like the building, the regeneration phase. Um, you see some granulation tissue, you'll see epithelialization. And epithelialization, that's that little pink tissue that normally you see around the borders of the wound that you don't want to um, damage, you want to promote. Sometimes you can actually see little islands of it, you know, sprouting, which is great also, but normally it starts from the outside and it grows in, but either way that you get it, it's fantastic. You just want to promote it as much as possible. And, um, you know, the final phase, phase is uh, maturation, which can happen throughout the healing process and it can continue and continue. Now, something else that you'll notice is with wounds, sometimes, you know, they can be in between a stage and it takes them a little while to move through those actual stages. It's not until there's an infection that, you know, it might seem like the wound is going back into another stage. So oh, basically, um, mm -hmm. when you have chronic wounds, uh, they sort of stuck in the inflammatory stage. And there's several reasons why they may be stuck in, in the inflammatory stage. Um, it could be that the wound is infected. It could be that the wound is not getting uh, enough uh, vascularization. Um, so, you know, there's several reasons. But the whole idea is that you want to treat the wound so that it progresses. Uh, Continually. Mm. I agree. Okay. So what are the wound bed goals? What are the goals? When we're looking at a wound bed, what do we, we want to see? You what want, do you want to see? You want the wound bed to be moist, mm -hmm. right? You want you want to see beefy red tissue. I, I usually like tell hamburger them, meat. Yes, I tell okay. my patient that I like hamburger meat. That mm -hmm. would suggest that the wound bed is well vascularized. Okay. It's nice and red. Sometimes it's pink, mm -hmm. and and that's okay as long as you can see that the wound is starting to close. Um, you know, some people's uh, vasculature is is much richer than others. Um, you want to see a nice stable, uh, by stable, I mean normal peri wound area, no maceration, no cellulitis, no induration. And you definitely want the wound bed to be free of any kind of necrotic tissue. So whatever you need to do to remove the necrotic tissue, you have, you can do that. So we'll talk some more about so some options. Before you go a little further, you say the peri area stable. Why is it so important for the peri, area, the peri area to be just as stable as the wound bed? Because if the peri area is macerated or mm -hmm. you have signs of infection uh, in the peri wound area, mm -hmm. um, it's going to affect the wound bed. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so you definitely want to, to consider the peri wound um, part of your whole thinking process. And um, if it's macerated, mm -hmm. definitely the wound bed is, the skin is going to break down mm -hmm. and the wound bed will expand. And that's not the, your goal. You're looking for contraction, which is, is, is actually part of wound healing. You know, and you want the wound to start contracting and closing. Yeah. You know, with that in mind, you know, I like to, obviously with my different dressings, I like to uh, make sure I can control as much uh, excessive moisture as possible. But on the outside of the wound, I'll also, you know, uh, put some zinc on there to kind of make a barrier, kind of make it stable so that 
not as much wound as uh, much uh, fluid is sitting on top of that uh, peri area. And, and that's a really good mm -hmm. idea. You could use a barrier cream, you could use zinc oxide, mm -hmm. um, you could use um, a hydrocolloid, a thin hydrocolloid. I mean, there are, there, there are many options. And, um, you know, you, you know, you could talk to other therapists mm -hmm. and um, wound care physicians and find out what it is that they use. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're sharing with you today. So, yeah, those are options. So let's say you get to the point where the wound needs to be debrided. So the debridement is really removal of <coughs> necrotic tissue from the wound bed and wound debris. Now, selective debridement, um, it can be done uh, using forceps. It could be sharp, it could be enzymatic. Um, and also you could use, have autolytic debridement and different types of dressings and different types of products could give you um, those um, and different instruments. Non-selective debridement um, usually is, is the same, you're debriding, but you're going to viable tissue, the, you're, you're enlarging the wound bed and it's usually performed by a, a physician. Um, the thing is, for the therapist, they could do uh, the selective debridement. You just basically remove and devitalize tissue, uh, gray tissue, black tissue, loose hanging tissue, loose hanging fibrinous yellow tissue. You could remove those with a pair of scissors. Uh, but for, for debridement and, and, and getting to viable wound margins to make the wound an acute wound and a healthy wound to start the healing process, accelerate the healing process. That's um, by to be done by a physician. And in excisional, that's when you really extend the margin. You know, my most of my debridement that I do um, is done with either um, forceps or uh, scissors. But a lot, most even more, is done with um, gauze. You gauze, gauze, yes. Uh, Sorry about that. Yeah, gauze and uh, Q-tips. But um, what I've recently noticed, there's a new thing on the market, um, and it's uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a soft sponge that debrides uh, really well, also, and it actually, when you're uh, going in, you know, gently with a little bit of. Oops, it, uh, someone's on, but um, when you're doing that little excessive force, the good thing about it, it's kind of, it knows to keep the um, healthy tissue intact. So as long as you're not moving around uh, too hard, it's, uh, it's a good tool to use. So um, let's talk about different types of debridement. So mechanical debridement, Debridement um, uh, is when you use force to use uh, for devitalized tissue. So that used to be the old wet to dry. It's, we don't use wet to dry like the anymore. They are traumatic to the, the wound bed. Um, and then, of course, you have enzymatic debridement. Um, collagen, collagenase is the only one on the market. It works slowly. Uh, it works from the bottom up. So for uh, maybe a week or two, you mm -hmm. want to see a, a magical clearing of mm -hmm. the fibrin, but over time, you will be able to remove the fibrin and, and uh, the slough, even, even sometimes with gauze. Uh, sharp debridement is when you would, of course, use scissors, scalpels, and, and instruments that could actually cut. Um, autolytic debridement uh, would be when the body uses its own fluid and, and, and enzyme to get rid of um, the cross material. So you could use a hydrocolloid to do that? You could use a hydrocolloid to do that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, surgical debridement, you know, you uh, for that podiatrist or physician will do, um, you know, they could use um, any type of in, uh, sharp cutting instruments to do that in, in or out of the OR. OR. When to debride, to debride or to not, <laughs> to not to debride? 
That's the question. Yes. Ah, a little Shakespeare here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's focus on what not to debris, because I think people may have an idea of what to debris. But you don't want to debris granular tissue. You don't want, if they, you see healthy tissue growing in, you don't want to debris that. There's no need to debris it every week or every three days, um, because you basically. Now, if you have a desk in the field, in a patient who has peripheral artery obstructive disease, any kind of ischemic limb, you don't want to debris that because then, well, first of all, it will return. And secondly, um, you now open the wound up for infection, okay? Because you, you've broken that protective barrier. Now, sometimes uh, you have to consider well, what do you, you do after you debride it? Um, you know, and you, you have a healthy wound bed. What type of dressings are you going to use? Well, you've got your contact layer, which um, is actually any layer that's actually in contact with the wound. So that could be your medication, that could be a non adherent dressing, um, anything that, and it could be a gel, any type of first layer that's actually touching that wound. Then the second layer doesn't necessarily have to be an absorbent. It can be, but it's the second layer after that first layer. All right. So you could use mm -hmm. um, any type of dressing as your mm -hmm. contact layer. Sometimes people use collagen, you know, gels. Um, it, it, it just depends. Um, and there are many different types of dressing. Wound care has just sort of exploded with different categories of dressing. But so we will only mention a few here. Uh, hydrocolloids, uh, alginates, and basically they're made from seaweed. They are absorptive. Um, you have your foam dressings. And then you also have your polymeric membrane dressings, which is a polyurethane membrane that's on the outside of the foam. It allows water vapor. It's porous and allows water vapor to escape, but it is occlusive, so nothing from the outside of the womb can get into the womb bed. And those are also very, very effective. How does it all work? How does a collagen work? Okay, so the body makes four or five different types of collagen, and um, it's used in, in, in to build the structure of the skin and used to build the structure of um, the granulation tissue. Well, when we use a collagen dressing from uh, another source like bovine collagen, like from a cow, what happens is that the, the wool bed can have uh, metallo matrix proteinases or enzymes that basically break down the collagen that the body is building as fast as it's building it. When you add another collagen there, that collagen becomes the substrate. So now the, the, the enzymes are breaking down the collagen that you put on the wound bed, which actually gives the body collagen a chance to grow without being chopped, 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 chopped. Okay. And you know, when I think about, you know, a silver product, I think about I'm trying to minimize or decrease the bio burden, the infection, and you know, promote healing as fast as possible. So when I look at a silver product, I think of reducing infection for the most part. Yes. Mm -hmm. So silver is a heavy metal, mm -hmm. and uh, heavy metals are, are toxic to most enzymes. So, um, so when you have those metallo matrix proteinases in the wound bed. Um, and any other type of enzyme that would be adverse to the wound bed, the silver can slow them down and it acts as a really good antimicrobial. And, you know, um, alginates, you know, are basically made out of uh, seaweeds and they have uh, the ability to pull, pull and uh, keep a lot of the fluid off of the actual wound bed. So it's more for a, I'd say a moderate to a heavy drainage wound. And then you have the hydrocolloid dressings, which are almost like a second skin. They're good with autolytic debridement um, and um, they, you know, for 
superficial wounds, they're excellent. And then, of course, you have, um, and these are only a few the types of wounds. Uh, you know, we, we haven't gone the whole gamut. Um, there's, uh, there's, there are products that have methylene blue and gentian violet and polyvinyl alcohol. And, and, and it comes as a foam, um, either dry or moist, and you can use those. And those provide antimicrobial properties so as well. With that in mind, you know, I think, you know, some people may know what we're talking about when we're talking about the methylene blue product, um, the one that's dry and then you hydrate it with saline solution. Um, when would you use one versus the other? When would you use one that you need to hydrate? When would you use one that's um, already ready? <laughs> okay, so the thing is you should hydrate. They mm -hmm. both should be hydrated. Mm -hmm. it, the, the, red, the one that's already hydrated is just as a matter of convenience. It's mm -hmm. a, a, a ready, ready. If the wound is heavily exudating, mm -hmm. You may be able to use the the one that's dry because mm -hmm. you have it's going to become moist the minute you put it in the wound bed. Mm -hmm. But remember, dry wounds don't heal well, mm -hmm. so we always want a moist wound bed. Fantastic. Okay, what are your thoughts on nutrition? Okay, so especially in lymphedema patients and wound patients, they lose protein. And they, they require, the body requires protein for building blocks uh, to have to uh, make new tissue. So um, you, I steer them in my patients in the direction of uh, protein-rich foods, meats, beans, dairy. Um, if I check a pre-albumin level and, uh, you know, I had a patient recently with a stage four pressure injury and had a pre-albumin of 10. Well, that's not going to heal. And if, if we use a negative pressure therapy and they don't have the building blocks, then you're spending, uh, you know, a fair amount of money on this therapy. And it's like trying to drive a car without gas. So then I would recommend a, a protein supplement. And they can get some of those over the counter and, um, you know, take it twice a day or three times a day um, based on the product. Vitamin C and zinc is helpful or, mighty, or, or multivitamin. And um, those are just sort of the basics you, for nutrition. You know, I heard you say, um, you know, if you're using negative pressure and you're pulling a lot of fluid and that's, you know, even all these patients, you know, they require a lot more protein. Um, you know, some of the therapists, if you see or you believe that the wounds are not healing, right, you might want to send them out for, you know, some labs, send them to their uh, primary care, to their uh, wound care physician, see if have their proteins checked. Um, also, you know, something I like to do a lot is um, see how much, look at their diets and see how much protein they're taking. And I, I, I like to promote people eating a lot of Atlantic salmon, a lot of, because it has collagen, you know, they take it from inside. And then at the same time, there's a lot of uh, protein in there, along with all of the fatty acids and all those other good uh, things. But, you know, sometimes people can't afford all uh -huh. those kind of things. Yeah. yeah. So then I tell them sardines mm -hmm. and, you know, other, other protein rich foods and that works. And also remember that in the lymph fluid, it's that they are losing protein. So, you know, you want to help them replace that. Well, so, well, Cook, tell me so, about this. Well, sorry, to, just to throw it on you like that. Well, um, this is actually, you know, one of the patients that I've actually, I think we both shared this patient. Um, I think this was one of your wonderful referrals. <laughs> Um, this is a gentleman that had a uh, traumatic accident and um, got infected and had to have his leg uh, rebuilt and he's also and his whole leg had to be rebuilt and then he also um, is diabetic he's I think he's only 44 45 yeah. Yeah. something of that sort but I will say when he did come into the clinic he his the smell was rancid mm -hmm. um, Obviously, you can see that was um, very, very, very much infected. Um, and, you know, for the most part, I treated most of this in-house. 
um, different debriding agents, different topical medication. But at the same time, I did send them back to you yeah. to have them debrided a few times. Um, and this gentleman also, once he did get better, uh, it's really interesting that he went back and forth because at one point um, in the posterior portion of his leg below his uh, popliteal fossa, he started uh, having a black fluid just leak out of there, which he had another infection. Um, so for him to be where he's at now, where you see his leg with the you know bright red beefy hamburger, uh, yes, hamburger looks delicious, you know. Um, it's a it's a long it's a long way and um, so yeah, but it's interesting you know you can see on the top you can see the epithelial rotation even though you see all that necrotic growth you can see you can see how it grew from the um, outside in. Yeah, so that red uh, reddish pink area uh, <laughs> at, at, at the, the periphery of the root, then you know that the wound is trying to granulate uh, mm -hmm. and it, it's trying to close, but you know all of that necrotic tissue is stopping it. So you've got to get rid of that. Okay, so, oh, tell us about this. Okay. Well, this one, um, this I will say was a very challenging patient. Um, all these pictures are from when he first started. Uh, the first picture is a wound that he had uh, underneath many of his lobules. I literally had to pull it back to find uh, that lobule. Um, I treated that portion of the wound with uh, methyl uh, blue BBA products for the most part. It was really challenging actually keeping the dressing on there. Um, so actually finding something to keep it to adhere was the most challenging portion. But this gentleman also had a traumatic uh, uh, injury, but he also had a lot of issue with weight before that, and it didn't help. help. Then he had to have surgeries and multiple surgeries. Uh, um, and so that's what came out of it. Mm -hmm. um, as you see over to the right, you can see that's what his foot looked like. Um, his actual, that's not his toe, that's uh, lobules that were on covering up his toes so you can see them. This is what he looks like now. Okay, oh, what's, since we since we there while while we figure out what hap happened to uh, that patient, let's go to the other patient. Um, let's go to the other patient um, who was actually a patient of mine. This was a very non-compliant patient. Um, he had lymphedema, he's obese, he's in his 40s. And, um, you know, as you could see the maceration um, uh, towards the base of the wound and, and the outside of the wound. So he started, the wound started to expand, primarily because he had a high sodium diet and he would come in and uh, uh, we would ask him, you know, what did you have to eat? And we, we work with the dietitian in our center. And he would say, well, I had bun and I had uh, salted this and fries. And, you know, so I had to end up, you know, I debrided him. You could see um, on the left, on the lateral aspect of his leg that was black um, and things improved. Uh, you know, I had, if this was a long, a, lo a long process and his non-compliance, he moved forward, backward, forward, backward, forward, backward. So I don't have an endpoint picture to show you. Okay, I'm gonna go back and see if those other pictures are available. So. <laughs> okay, well, I guess, the, the picture, uh, some of the pictures didn't pop up. Uh, um, I, I'm sorry about that. Uh, we apologize for that. We're not sure what happened. But um, this would probably
probably be a good time to uh, answer some questions. Answer some questions, and maybe we could uh, talk yes. to Cam and. Yes, so first off, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Smith and Kirk. Very informative, and we did have a couple of questions come through. Um, so the first one is kind of geared around where would you recommend um, a PT or OT or lymphedema therapist to uh, go for certification uh, for, for wound care? Um, let's uh, see, there's... Take... Go ahead. Yeah. So there's a couple places, but probably the um, wound care, American Board of Wound Care oh, Healing. Wound management, yeah. yeah. So uh, that's a good one. That That's one that I recommend. There's also, I believe it's uh, uh, wound care educators, but uh, the first one, that's what I prefer. Okay, excellent. Uh, next question, um, and this is something you both would be pretty poised to answer. Uh, how often is hyperbaric therapy needed for treating wounds? And I know it's going to differ from patient to patient, but what are some kind of basic fundamentals, since we are relatively short on time, that you can just talk to about hyperbarics uh, and treating wounds? Oh, great. Um, that's my forte. Um, hyperbarics, there are 14 diagnoses that um, we can treat that are that will be covered by the insurance. In terms of wound, diabetic foot ulcers that have an infection, okay? Um, lymphedema is not one, and a polyheating, poly healing soft tissue wound, it has to be something like necrotizing fasciitis for it to be covered. Um, otherwise, it, the cost of it is, is very expensive because hyperbaric treatment generally, um, most times it's about 30 treatments, five days a week, and the treatments are about two hours long, 90 minutes under. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so this was a question that I actually have. Uh, one of the slides you guys were talking about, just identifying different infections, different symptoms that you notice. And one thing that I know is, is relatively common for lymphedema patients specifically is episodes of cellulitis. Mm -hmm. So can you maybe talk just super high level of how you guys um, clinically are, um, you know, finding those symptoms for cellulitis and things that you can do right away or what kind of the protocol for that should be? So, uh, yes, I, so I caution my patients all the time time um, about the ease with which they can get cellulitis because staff lives on the skin. You have staff and staff living on the skin. So, um, you know, if they go to get their nails done, I advise them, don't have anybody cut the cuticles. If you find that you're, you're looking at your limb or wherever you have lymphedema and it's red, warm, seek medical attention immediately um, because you may have cellulitis and because um, the lymph fluid is what has all the cells and proteins that fight infection. If that's not flowing well, your infection can spread rapidly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I always tell my patient, um, seek medical attention. Now, some patients say, well, why don't you just give me the antibiotics? And oh, if I see it, I'll start taking it. I don't like that approach because that puts the burden on the patient to diagnose themselves. You know, they may have cellulitis, yes, or it could be something else. Uh, it could be necrotizing fasciitis, and taking a few pills is not going to help. But if they go to a licensed physician, the, that person could tell them, okay, yes, this is what we need to do. You do have cellulitis. And, you know, I like to tell, like, uh, a lot of the uh, therapists, when they're not, you know, when they're not sure if the patient has cellulitis, say you touch them with the back of your hand, it's warm, it looks map-like, um, or it's more faint than that and you're not really sure. The patient's not complaining of excessive heat, they're not complaining of flu-like symptoms, you know, things that are associated with it. What I tell them to do is um, you, one of two things. You can either take a Sharpie and follow the end of the, um, the, the heat marks, if you will, where they think it may be. And then when they come back, look at it, you know, look at it. Has it gotten any further? If you feel like 
50, 60% more that it possibly may be, I automatically tell them, go see their PCP, go to an urgent care. And, you know, more than likely, even if the physician is not 100% sure, they'll probably start them on a regimen. And that way, the patient either gets diagnosed, they get started on a regimen, they don't miss as much therapy. And at the same time, they don't end up in the hospital with something serious, they don't end up septic or something of that nature. When in doubt, send them out. <laughs> That, that, yeah. <laughs> when in doubt, send them up. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, so we have time for one more quick question, and then I'll let you guys close with um, with flow if you'd like. So the final question is: What contact dressings do you primarily use when um, we normally don't allow patients to remove bandaging for days at a time? So I guess if they're going through maybe CDT in the lymphedema space and they're wrapped what kind of contact dressings would you primarily use for those kinds of patients? So, um, there, a, a lot of the silver dressings um, and, uh, or antimicrobial dressings, they're designed to, to go uh, to, be, to be some for a week or some for two or three days. And that falls mm -hmm. in line with the schedule they would have with their therapist. Mm -hmm. So there's several products. Mm -hmm. I would just possibly make sure that either the contact layer or the secondary layer is a heavy absorbent mm -hmm. um, because fluid is going to go out of the uh, path of least resistance. And if you've got a hole or wound in your leg or arm or chest, wherever it may be, it's going to go out of there first. So I would just, you know, if you know that that patient's not coming back because of certain reasons, they're not coming back on a perfect schedule, like three times a week or four times a week, make sure you have a, a medium to heavy uh, absorbent. And there's so many different types of absorptive dressings. There are mm -hmm. some that can absorb as much as 10 times mm -hmm. uh, its weight. Mm -hmm. So, um, you, you know, and we mentioned mm -hmm. some others that you can use as well. And so, I wouldn't be, sorry, I wouldn't be afraid to add a third layer. Um, now, when I add a third layer, I'm always thinking of, is it really benefiting the patient? And I'm also thinking about the cost also, because that might not be the one time you use it. So what is the right product or what, you know, can you put together to be the right product for that patient, especially if they're a long-term patient? Yeah. And one other thing, we wanted to show you a picture that did not come up. Um, I tell my patients, if for some reason, they find that the dressings are uncomfortable um, or they, you know, their toes are turning blue mm -hmm. or, 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 or any reason that they, they need to take the dressing off. Mm -hmm. Do not use scissors but, or any sharp instrument, but unwrap the dressing. Um, because we've had, I've had patients have put, put, taken a, a, a pot spoon and used the handle because they felt they, they, it was itching. They, they, they put whatever uh, that they can, and that can cause friction and cause wounds. And we actually had pictures to show there, you that. There was actually a patient that um, therapist called me in to look at a patient's wound. And I looked at the patient's wound and they showed me the other leg and they said, yeah, they were used a fly swatter to uh, scratch their uh, scratch their leg while it was at the bandage, but the fly swatter got stuck in the uh, the end of the fly swatter got stuck in the bandage. So uh, I couldn't believe it until I looked down, and the imprint of the fly swatter was actually on or impressed in the in the leg, and I had that picture to show it. <laughs> um, you can't make this stuff up. No, you know, I, and some. If you don't have the picture to show, um, people who, uh, who don't do this very often think, you know, that can't be real. So um, I know I'm kind of running out of time. Did you let me go ahead and say? Yes. Yeah, so the, so the final, final two minutes, if you guys have any parting words or want to talk about the other initiative, you got two minutes to wrap that up. Yeah. So, um, you know, with all the inabilities that most patients have, have to get uh, funding for compression garments, which we know is paramount in this type of environment. Um, a few of us, uh, Mahalia and I have uh, co-founded a company called, uh, or excuse me, a nonprofit called Flow, 
Along with that, we've had some very talented people that are part of it. Cam is one of them. And um, in the next uh, year coming soon will be a way to help these pe people um, get these products that they need. Um, and um, yeah, more, there'll be more to come uh, next year. So FLOW stands for funding, lymphedema, obstruction, lymphatic. lymphatic obstruction and wellness and wellness. So we hope to do some um, uh, education as well, but most importantly, to be able to fund the garments that so many insurance companies do not pay for. They pay for the MLD and the bandaging, but we all know that if you don't have the garments to continue, it, it, it's not worthwhile. All right. Absolutely. So, so thanks again, Dr. Smith and Kirk, for uh, guests presenting today. And again, we'll have this recorded and, and put a YouTube page and sent out to everybody. And we'll also send a follow-up email to everyone with that link and the flyer for our upcoming in-person happy hour, the one-year anniversary of Lumpy Heroes Houston, and in honor of October being Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So thanks again, everyone. Hope you guys have a great weekend, and we will be in touch. Just keep limping. Take care.